um, before starting the session, I would like to know how was the paper? Was it easy? Was it tough? Mm -hmm. So how was the paper? Please, I do want it to be moderate. Okay, okay. This is a mistake. Okay. See, this questions, whatever I have said, is actually to say these are from the very uh, important topics and some are little vague questions yes i know those some are vague questions some are screen can you not see the screen i'm no i'm able to see rotate okay yes okay fine okay so this is a graph that have um, there are the percentage of the OBG questions in this uh, NSIT, INICTCA, whatever questions, what is the percentage that is according to the years, past five years I have uh, given here. So that means OBG is important. And uh, recently the questions, the patterns they ask is kind of different. Uh, new uh, whatever updates of um, from obstetrics as well as gynecology, they've asked many questions. And um, topics like ectopic pregnancy, yes, that is also a very important topic as we have discussed in a previous class that uh, many important questions have been asked from a very different kind of questions also was asked. Uh, th those are like one or two questions, not to worry much about it, but remember when you're reading a topic, it is important that you understand the basic concept of the topic. Even if you don't know anything of the question, if you read a question, you would have already read the topic, but still you're not able to answer. Try to rule out. Okay, that is one method you can solve most of the questions. Don't panic as soon as you see the question. Okay, I'm not read this question. Don't give up there. So you start uh, ruling out the option, read the question, rule of the options, and you can proceed. Okay. So we will be discussing our questions quickly. See, uh, this question is actually when I have to say from, uh, uh, since I've completed OBG, it looks, uh, this is a wonderful question. Well, this um, perimodern cesarean section, as personally I have noticed only one perimodern cesarean section, not it's commonly seen. So yes, this was a question that was asked, but the topic is difficult. When you read the question, it looks difficult. But yes, this is an uh, easy question if you understand what is perimortem. Perimortem cesarean section. So um, how many of you got this answer right? Was it the answer? It was cesarean section done in the upper segment. How many of you got it right? It is done in the lower or the upper it is done in the upper uterine segment so what you have to know about this well, okay was it given lower section no i knew this okay it is in the lower it is not in the lower uterine section it is in the upper uterine section this is directly from the uh, whatever i've sent i have added the answers okay okay let me tell you what is perimortem cesarean section Perimortem cesarean section, there is a very good article about it, which has come up. So there are a lot of studies have been going on in this. Okay, when I say perimortem cesarean section, cardiac arrest, when you talk about cardiac arrest in pregnancy, which is a rare phenomenon, very, very rarely seen. Okay, so whenever there is a cardiac arrest in a pregnant women, what happens? Delivery you conduct within five minutes of cardiac arrest. So this is your, if you know at least this much knowledge that the cardiac arrest, you have to deliver it within uh, five minutes. 
So what is the easiest way, which will be the apt method to deliver? Is it lower or upper? See, upper uterine segment you go, that is easier to approach, okay? Lower uterine segment takes time. Whenever you have to do a quick cesarean, you have to take out the baby immediately, okay? Then the upper uterine segment is the earliest, uh, that is the easiest to approach. So the answer will be upper uterine segment. What else you have to know? This is done if, what are the criteria for perimortem cesarean section? Just a pregnant woman who is having cardiac arrest doesn't mean you'll deliver her. Uh, you do a perimortem, see, she should be more than 20 weeks. You have given her four minutes of CPR. Okay, there is no, there is no ROAC, that is rapid return of spontaneous circulation, then you deliver her. So these two criteria, remember, cardiac arrest, which is a very rare phenomenon, if that occurs, deliver the baby within five minutes, that should, what are the criteria to be fulfilled? More than 20 weeks, four minutes of CPI you will give, still there is no rapid return of spontaneous circulation, then it's called, this is a criteria for the perimortem cesarean section. Remember, this perimortem cesarean section is not for the baby. Chicken, this perimortem cesarean section is not for the baby. How is it? Why are we doing this? This perimortem cesarean section is for the mother. Okay. This is going to help the mother for the improvement in the mother's condition. It's not for the baby. That much you have to remember. Okay. This much is enough for your perimortem cesarean section. Okay. Any doubt in this question? See, this is a very new question. Previously, it was never asked. But this is like, a, that's, this is how they are selecting questions. Though this topic sounds a uh, uh, little difficult, but it's, the options are very easy. You can easily get your answer. Okay. These kind of questions, don't panic. Think for some time, then answer. Yes. See, in uh, gynecology, sexuality and uh, sex differences and these questions are very, very important. Uh, so one thing, this question is a very direct question, easiest question, okay, of the whatever gynecology, this is the easiest question that I could frame. If you could get this answer right, other things, it will easily go. First thing is a young girl with amenorrhea. She is short stature and webbed neck. Ultrasound showing a hypoplastic uterus and streak ovaries. Okay. FSH and LH is increased. What is your diagnosis? Well, see she's short stature, webbed neck. All these are star points that is pointing towards your Turner syndrome. Okay. Very characteristic words to describe the Turner syndrome, short stature, webbed neck, hypoplastic uterus. That means the uterus is present, but they are in infantile stage, not well developed. FSS and LH is increased and she is presenting with primary amenorrhea. What is your diagnosis? So answer here, it's very simple, is Turner syndrome. We have to know the other options that is also given. Okay, that is important. So the question is easier. Other options, if you know, that will be still more. So uh, make sure these questions you will remember very well. Definitely you will get a question from this sexuality. You, you should know in and out. Okay. Sexuality. At least if you, no, you have not read it before, please read what is given in this. This might help you in ruling out options. At least whatever I have explained here, you remember that much. You can at least helping in ruling out the other options. MRKH is nothing but where you have all the absence of structures, that there is absence of developmental of the genital organs. So that means the inner, internal. Uterus, nothing you can see. So that much, if you have the knowledge, MRKH is ruled out. So they are saying it's hypoplastic uterus and streak ovary. So uterus and ovaries are there. So MRKH is ruled out. What is Kalman syndrome? Kalman syndrome is also called the D. Mossier syndrome. Always for syndromes, remember the other names. Somewhere, you need not have to buy heart. Some You read at least once or twice, you will remember somewhere you would have heard it. Then it's easier. 
So the defect lies at the level of hypothalamus and the main uh, nucleus that is affected is the arcuate nucleus. What is the triad that is they're presenting with? Anosmia, hypogonadism and color blindness. Okay. Um, how to remember this? I usually remember as ABC, anosmia, ABC is color blindness, B and C and hypogonadism. Okay. They present with high, uh, primary amenorrhea and they are normal high. Differentiates it from the constitutional delay. So this much you have to remember. Uh, and Kalman syndrome is previously asked questions. They have asked many times. Okay. So uh, remember the other name for Kalman syndrome, Demosier syndrome. Level of the defect lies at the hypothalamus. Arcuate nucleus is involved. Triad, hypogonadism, anosmia, color blindness primary amenorrhea, how do you differentiate from the constitutional delay here? The height is normal. Okay, this is important, is the Kalman syndrome. Next. So here is the one where you make a lot of mistakes. So please remember this chart properly. You can solve most of your questions from the sexuality topic. If a patient is presenting with primary amenorrhea, her breast development is well-developed breast development. So it is going to a standard stage of four to five with no pubic hair, bilateral inguinal hernia on examination. It goes under complete androgen, complete androgen insensitivity. Whereas if they have the same features plus clitoromegaly, they will go for incomplete androgen insensitivity. If they present with primary amenorrhea with absent or less developed sexual characteristics, height is normal. Streak ovaries, genotype is 46XX, then it's fewer syndrome. If the same thing is primary amenorrhea, absent or less developed sexual characteristics, height is short stature with streak ovaries and their genotype is 46XX, this will fall under your Turner syndrome. Siva syndrome, what is the important? Height is normal. If the patient is presenting with ambiguous genitalia with primary amenorrhea, features of virilization and when they, look, uh, the, they present as females, okay, 46XX, gonads are ovaries, heterosexual precocious puberty, clitoromegaly, metabolic abnormalities, they fall under congenital adrenal hypoplasia. See, this table looks very simple. If you remember the differences of each diagnosis, it is very, very easy to solve most of your topics from sexuality. Okay. And this is, uh, they, I have uh, seen most of the past five years paper, definitely they are having one or two topics one or two questions from these topics. So please give it a reading and this is important. You revise this. Okay, revise the table um, and you go for your exam. This is important. Don't forget to revise this. Okay. Any doubts in this? Okay, this has gone down. Just give me a minute. Any doubts till now? Any doubts? Am I too fast? I'll just show you the other. Um...
so basically i wanted to discuss about the da turner syndrome so i think the table has displaced it down it's just creating trouble i just want you to see the table so that it will be easier for you to understand one minute Yes. Okay, this is the table. See, there is important that you have to know Turner syndrome. You should not make mistake when they ask questions from Turner syndrome. It's a condition where it is presenting with the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Okay. So, what is the genotype? Genotype is nothing but what is the genetic level? What they are? They are uh, they are uh, mainly because of non disjunction. What is the most, uh, most commonly that you see? 45X0. Okay. So clear, uh, phenotypically, they look like females. But what is their uh, genotype? It is 45X0 is the most common. And uh, see, these tables I will be uh, giving to you. Please read the tables. I have made most of the contents into tables. So it will be easier for you to revise it. Okay. So they will present with primary amenorrhea, bilateral steak ovaries, but suboptimal estrogen levels. So secondary sexual characteristics are absent or they are less developed and decreased height. What? How do they present? They present infantile development of the fallopian tube, uterus, cervix. So that means all the internal genital organs of a female are present, but they are infantile in view of the estrogen is in a suboptimal level. External genitalia develops and it is normal because the testosterone is absent. What are you? I have given it at the different uh, periods of life. How do they present with? But what is important from the exam point of view? I have highlighted it. But you have to remember, which is the most cardiac anomaly that you see in a Turner syndrome is coarctation of iota. Most common renal problem that you see in Turner's is a horseshoe kidneys. What are the other things you have to know in adult life? They have so many other uh, comorbidities they do present with. But remember, they have a normal IQ. Other than that, which are the more standing out features we have to say? One is the spa widely spaced nipples, webbed neck, primary amenorrhea, short stretcher, micrognathia, heart analysis, renal analysis, yes. Treatment is a estrogen replacement therapy. The counterpart for the Turner syndrome is called the Noonan syndrome. That means it's called the male Turner syndrome. How is it different? Noonan syndrome, it is an autosomal dominant condition presenting with streak gonads. How is it different from Turner syndrome? They present with pulmonary valve stenosis, whereas in Turner syndrome, you have a coarctation of iota. When I'm talking about the IQ level is normal in case of a Turner syndrome, in Noonan syndrome, there is mental retardation. See, Noonan syndrome can be asked, uh, you will be reading in pediatrics as well. But remember, the male counterpart of the uh, Turner syndrome is called the Noonan syndrome. So this uh, you have to know. Yes. This is what the table that has gone down. I'm really sorry for it. When I'm giving you the notes, I will make sure I will uh, make it little uh, in a proper order and send. Okay. Yes. When I talk about um, antipartum hemorrhage, antipartum hemorrhage, obviously, everybody knows it's going to be a very star topic, must know topic, in and out. Another very important topic is PPH. Yes. So when I'm talking about abruption, uh, everything about abruption, see, they frame a question. When it Most times they frame a question if you have to give a clinical question. Abruption, they start with if there is a trauma. See, more to, when I say they start with saying trauma and they're presenting features like uh, painful bleeding with contraction and they present with fetal distress, that will go towards your abruption. 
okay that much you have to remember and similarly it's about the placenta previa so once you know the difference between the placenta previa placental abruption any type of questions whether they are going to ask you about a clinical or if they're going to just um, yes <coughs> we'll be discussing <coughs> ruchi we will be discussing okay about the uh, primary and secondary pph definitely will be discussing so that is also added okay <coughs> okay so when coming talking about this antepartum hemorrhage what you should know about antepartum hemorrhage placenta previa placental abruption and remember in williams this has been renamed as placental hemorrhagic diseases with that they have also added placenta accreta so what are the three important topics that you have to know from antepartum it will be both placenta previa placental abruption and placenta accreta it is also called morbidly adherent placenta or it's also called placenta accreta syndrome okay these three must know topics any one question will be definitely from these three topics when i talk about placenta previa see i have just compared it made it into a short table just revise this okay don't go and read from starting just go on, quickly give a revision all these tables okay <coughs> since i didn't have much time i will add some more tables whichever is important and i will send you as a final uh, uh, this one after your class okay uh, everything is in a tab uh, in a uh, tabular form please give a quick reading okay placenta previa remember they should if they have a history of placenta previa previous history they increase risk by 5% if they have two uh, two times they give a history of placenta previa they definitely they increase there is a increased risk compared to history of only once they have a placenta previa increased maternal age multiparity remember everything is increasing that means if the parity increases or the maternal age increases or there is a obvious cause if there is a previous uterine curettage or uterine surgeries which will latch like a nike for the placenta to go and implant there and the lower segment okay that acts like a nike for uh, implantation at the lower uterine segment increased placental size large size okay another is smoking smoking indirectly causes placental hypertrophy so that will lead to again increased size so try to remain in the lower segment leading to placenta previa or low lying placenta okay when you say it's a low lying placenta what is the difference between the placenta previa and low lying placenta come on quickly answer quickly answer this question This is important that you should know the difference between placenta previa and low-lying placenta. Quickly type in your chat box. Come on. Only if you are active, we can go fast. Huh? It's not going to be one way, na? I want it to be interactive class. It will improve us to do further, huh? Na? Answer, answer. Come on. So when I say low-lying placenta, nobody is giving me answer. Very good. Hmm. when i say the lower uterine segment so when do you say within 2 cm of your internal wall so within it it's called the low lying if it's going to cover it it's 2 cm okay 2 cm is the one you have to remember at least ruchi answered very good okay you try it it should be 2 cm Within two centimeters, going to be low, uh, low lying placenta. More than two centimeters, it's not going to be low lying, or it's going to be placenta. It's completely covering all. It's going to be a placenta previa. Okay. So how do the patient present with painless recurrent causeless bleeding? This is goes hand in hand. This is how you typically um, describe a placenta previa. They present with pallor. Uterus is soft and tender. It's going to bleed from the uh, placenta, so it's going to be purely maternal. most of the time it's maternal they present since the placenta is occupying the lower uterine segment they present with the mal presentations 
fetal heart sound in uh, is present the typical uh, the investigation of choice is transvaginal though it is lying at the lower uterine segment and uh, covering the os it is important that you do tvs why do you do tvs tvs goes only into the vagina and you're looking through the cervix and it is near okay so that's why tvs is done is the investigation of choice what is the expectant management this is a question they can ask met caffeine regime when you can expect lently manage if they are in a very very preterm and she's not having any active bleeding hemodynamically stable gestational age less than 37 see if it's even at 34 weeks you usually deliver but stick to the book if gestational age is 37 weeks ctg is reactive no fetal anomalies then you have expectantly managed when I say active management is nothing but you terminate the pregnancy respect of gestational age because she might not have one of the criteria we can expectantly manage the case. Next, we talk about the placental abruption. So placental abruption, top most cause is what? Preeclampsia, don't forget. Similarly, there is also if they have increased maternal age of parity, smoking, cocaine, placental abruption, prior abruption, leaking, uh, sudden, sudden, uh, leaking, PPR, P, uh, PROM or PPROM and twins where there is sudden gush of fluid coming out that will uh, predispose for early separation of the placenta. Okay. Next is about the clinical features. They present with abdominal pain, bleeding plus or minus. Depends on the what type. If it's a revealed abruption, they will present with bleeding. If it's a concealed so where they will blood will keep accumulating behind the placenta. So in blood will keep accumulating behind the placenta. So this it will lead to increase in the fundal height. So that is one more thing. And you will have a tense, tender abdomen. General condition is out of proportion to bleeding. Concealed abruption, the uterine size is larger. Fetal distress you can see in CTG. Absent fetal heart sound can also be seen. Next is about the management. Pritchard rule, it's not given in much books, but remember it's 30-30. 30% of the hematocrit to be maintained and 30 ml per hour of uh, urine output to be maintained. That is important to see. If a patient is diagnosed with abruption, see to that she will not go directly into shock. So Pritchard rule says at least a hematocrit of uh, 30 and uh, 30 ml per hour should be the urine output. Never wait for this. No diacolysis resuscitate the patient, mode of delivery should be cesarean section, fetal distrust, conjunctive coagulopathy, vaginal delivery if the fetus is dead or there is no active bleeding. Remember, no active bleeding or the fetus is dead, then you can go for a vaginal delivery too. It is not, a, it is not a, that you will definitely require a cesarean, but if the maternal condition is deteriorating, even without the uh, fetal indication, we will definitely deliver the patient. Terminate by cesarean section. Yes. Coming to the dose of carbitocin in PPH. So what is carbitocin? What is a carbitocin? So Ruchi was asking, there is primary and secondary PPH. So primary PPH is called what do you see is primary? When do you say it's secondary? Anybody could answer this? See, primary is when, when there is a PPS that you notice within 24 hours of delivery and which is the most common cause is the uterine atony. But secondary PPS is after 24 hours up to 12 weeks. Carbitocin is a long-acting uh, oxytocin analog. It's very important. It's a long-acting oxytocin analog. Okay. And its dose is 100 milligram. This is a very, 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 very important um, expected question, I will say. And what are the three, four T's in PPH? Tone, trauma tissue and thrombin. If you know these things, you can answer a PPH question. What these are the causes? 
tone if the tone decreases that is uterine atonicity is the most common cause trauma any type it can be cervical tear laceration tissue retained placenta bits even that can lead to bleeding trauma is a consumptive coagulopathy what are the risk factors you have to know so pph what are the things you have to know what are the what is primary what is secondary pph and what are the causes which is the most common cause okay and what are the steps that you go you can't be jumping you have to see what are the steps so this is a step that's how you go and what are the maximum level you can give doses all that you have to know okay So first step is a uterine massage and oxytocin. Uh, oxytocin you give both as prophylactic as well as therapeutic. And uh, if they ask which is the first line of drug of PPH, the answer will be oxytocin. Next, what you have to talk about is the injection ergometrine. It's 0.2 mg IM. Maximum number of doses that can be given is five doses. Okay. and contraindicated in preeclampsia organic uh, heart diseases and side effect is hypertension definitely so it should not be given in preeclampsia uh, pg1 that is mesoprostol can also be given as 800 microgram sublingual or oral or you can also give it as rectal injection pgf2 alpha is a carboprost you give it as 250 microgram im up to eight doses so these are the important things you have to remember contraindicated in asthma pulmonary hypertension patients and side effect is hypertension and diarrhea injection tranexamic acid is a newer uterine massage not intermittent assessment yes that question is also coming up i will let you know okay that's why i'm i have not told you about it because there is a separate question i want to make clear what to be written that those question i will explain to you shortly okay what are the mechanical methods you have to know there are many methods bakri balloon singleton blakes then everything you have to know what is the capacity and condom catheter singleton blake more tube and bakri balloon they have asked previously what is its capacity that's a direct question it's 300 to 500 to be very apt answer will be 500 ml it can be removed after 12 year uh, 12 hours of bleeding stops what are the surgical methods you start first with the uterine compression sutures which is a beelin sutures what are the other things hemen okay beelin hemen cho sutures what is uterine artery ligation that is one thing you have to remember uterine artery ligation internal artery ligation see internal artery ligation can be asked as an image based question okay that is important uterine artery ligation internal artery ligation can be asked as image based questions okay and uh, it's a life saving subtotal hysterotomy other options are angiographic embolization aortic compression these will gonna be the last okay yes chose to, uh, chose uh, is nothing but a square suture that you apply which you put like a box suture it's also called cho It's also called box box sutures. It's also called square sutures, box sutures. Okay. See, still this is gonna be. If I go on and on, it's gonna be a very uh, big class. Okay. So it will be a little faster so that I can complete. So I'm just stuck in fifth question. Okay. Okay, we'll go to our next question. So, what was your question? What was the answer for this? Everybody got this question right. How many of you made mistakes in these question? This question is very, 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 very important question. See, your ectopic pregnancy is like a base for many. Similarly, how there will be a lot of questions on sexuality. similarly ectopic pregnancy is a very important topic and uh, molar pregnancy is not much compared to that of ectopic but ectopic you have should have a clear basic concept okay what is a critical titer for tvs transvaginal ultrasound answer this quickly 
what is the critical titer value for a transvaginal ultrasound, the recent one? Come on, answer. Two thousand five hundred. Okay. What else? See, please remember for transvaginal ultrasound, the recent one is three thousand five hundred international units is the critical titer, the new titer, uh, new um, critical titer value. You have to remember. And next is your trans uh, trans abdominal. It is five thousand to six thousand. The uh, apt answer is. 6,000. Okay, that you stick to it, 6,000. So, what is this question is about a woman complains of right-sided lower abdominal pain, pain with mild bleeding per vagina for one day after a period of amenorrhea of six weeks. See, usually these patients do not go more than six to eight weeks. Her condition is satisfactory. There is tenderness, is right iliac fossa. The uterine... Um, Sorry, the urine HCG test is positive. Transvaginal scan does not reveal any adenexal mass or an intrauterine pregnancy. What is your next step in the management? That means all features, whatever they have given, is suggestive of an ectopic pregnancy. It's six weeks, but she has done an ultrasound. So remember this table. Always remember this table. If a patient is presenting with amenorrhea plus her UPT is positive, and still her vagina, she complains of vaginal bleeding and her vitals are stable. This is very important. If they say unstable, your first diagnosis always, you think if she's pregnant, her UPT positive and she's presenting with vaginal bleeding and vitals are unstable, no doubt you're taking her for laparotomy. That will be your next answer. You stabilize the patient, stabilize in the sense, give fluids similar, simultaneously shift her to OT and do a laparotomy. You will always consider that as an ectopic pregnancy, even though if you don't know what is the diagnosis, any patient presenting with amenorrhea, you put a positive with vaginal bleeding, vitals unstable, your first diagnosis will be ectopic pregnancy. Push her to a OT and do a laparotomy to see what is your exact diagnosis. So next, say they are saying the vitals are stable. So what is your next step? So she's stable. So you are going to proceed with your ultrasound. Now ultrasound you're doing, this is going to be an investigation of choice in these kind of presentation. And ultrasound, you are seeing a gestational sac in the uterus. For say, you are seeing a gestational sac in uterus. So this is going to be intrauterine pregnancy. No doubt. If you're seeing a uterus is empty, then you will turn your probe and see your adenexa next. Any pregnancy, once you finish seeing your non uterus adenexa to be looked, it's very, very important. Adenexa is checked. If you see uh, adenexa with a gestational sac with the cardiac activity, then it will point towards your diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. But adenexa, you're seeing adelexa is normal. The sense you're not seeing any gestational sac, not, no, no signs of any pregnancy in the adenexa. Then what is your next step of action? Here comes the beta HCG. How does beta HCG help us? It comes under the diagnosis for pregnancy of unknown location. Pregnancy of unknown location. Either it means, when I say pregnancy of unknown location, it means it can be either abortion or early pregnancy loss, or it can be ectopic pregnancy, or it can be an early intrauterine pregnancy. Chicken. So accordingly, we will go. When I say pregnancy of unknown location, you're doing a beta HCG. What happens to beta HCG in pregnancy of unknown location? See, and uh, see, remember you're doing a beta HCG. If the beta HCG is less than 3,500 international units, okay, you will repeat beta HCG till you get a critical titer. Okay. If the patient is showing more than 3,500 international units, Plus, still it is an empty uterus. What else you will do? Okay. You will repeat after 48 hours beta HCG. And if the beta HCG repeating after 48 hours decreases, then it is nothing but it's a 
failing pregnancy is also called abortion or she is aborting or if it is getting double it is called the it is your normal intrauterine pregnancy if the same thing plateaus plateaus you it points towards a ectopic pregnancy if if it is titer is more than 3500 still you have a empty uterus go for dnc if you find a chorionic villi it points towards your pregnancy if its chorionic villi is absent it is ectopic pregnancy okay this table you must remember this is how you proceed so most of your um, options you will remember will come from your this table so don't forget um this one i have a, another uh, formatted another uh, already typed table which i will be sharing it means um i had very short time for these things so i am just showing in a written format okay yeah, i will be sharing that one too. next yes see now recently there was lot of questions from mtp me you have a you should have early eiup is nothing but early intrauterine i'm sorry for the short forms i'm trying to accommodate this in this one paper okay so it's early intrauterine pregnancy okay very early intrauterine pregnancy that can be diagnosed only by beta hcg and you not see anything okay like a gestational sac or any uh, fetal uh, uh so that will be very confusing so that is why comes the role of your beta hcg next we'll start with the mtp see mtp topic is going to be a very very important topic you have to know all the methods and first trimester methods second trimester methods what are the so what questions they are framed previously previously also they framed questions from what are the drugs used in the first trimester so the option is prefi mifeprostone mesoprostol methotrexate as well as tamoxifen don't forget tamoxifen definitely we'll forget about tamoxifen and methotrexate mifeprostone everybody remembers mesoprostol also we remember the two drugs extra you have to remember is methotrexate and tamoxifen what are the surgical methods what are the method surgical methods menstrual regulation manual vacuum aspiration suction evacuation and dilatation and curettage dilatation and evacuation see it is curettage d and c is done in the first trimester d and e is done in your second trimester that is with the ovum forceps done until 15 weeks do not forget this and what is the drug that is used in the second trimester these two you will definitely remember carboprost is one of the drug we will not remember So remember, second trimester carboprost is also used in the termination of pregnancy. This table is directly from the Williams. What are the other drugs? Other things that is used? Hyperosmotic. These are the drugs. Either you put it intrauterine or intraamniotic, or it's in the extraamniotic space. Installation of the hyperosmotic solution or a hypertonic urea or saline. or uh, extramniotic ethacrylic lactate or prostaglandins or you give, give an oxytocin infusion or in last nothing nothing has helped in these things last resort is your hysterotomy okay next question i am not going to explain i want you people to answer what are the des that is nothing but dietal still breastrol causes an increased risk of clear cell vaginal carcinoma that's no doubt it's a very straight forward direct question so what are the other options what are the other uh, things it causes come on answer i want answers from you i'm not going to answer for this come on it's a very direct question you would have read left and right for these things des causes increases for what other things anybody come on you have to answer this have you not people solved this question how many of you got this right infertility hypoplastic uterus okay then 
Only Ruchi is answering. Only Ruchi is attending the class. Ruchi and Mohan Raj answered. Come on, others. Please answer. It's okay. Whatever you know, please answer. If I don't get a proper response, what do you? What can I help? Like, how can I make it more better? Na, come on, answer. That's it. Okay. Vaginal adenosis is okay. I this answer will be. This you people will answer. I will just give a table. Okay. This is a direct question. Very very simple question. So the answer for this is clear cell vaginal carcinoma is. Uh, the direct uh, answer for this, I'm not going to explain. I'm going to give you a table, but I want you to people to read of dietal still bestrol. It's a very important question. What are the other things you have to know? Yes. See, contraceptive never make a mistakes in contraceptive. See that though it looks a vast thing, this is a place where you can easily score because the questions will be very direct. It's like one plus one is equal to two. That's how it is the OCP questions. So kindly read OCPs, I mean, um, contraceptives in and out. Contraceptives is a very, very easy topic actually. Okay. Since it's little vast, many people skip it. Please don't skip it. You'll have very, very easy. Is it scariest topic? Ruchi, a little late. It's the easiest topic, I will say. When I was in PG, yes, even I felt that was the most difficult topic. I'll tell you, this is the most easiest topic you can read and you can score easily. Contraceptives are there both in PSM as well as you will have questions both in obstetrics. So it is very, very important. I will be sharing some of the contraceptive things. At the end, please read it. I have consolidated as much as possible. Just to give a reading. I think you can finish in uh, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, full uh, contraceptive topics. So give it a reading and um, it will be helpful. Okay. I have uh, uh, um, shortened it. See, they are uh, always asking questions from what are the non contraceptive benefits of the OCP? OCP OCPs per se is a very important topic. Okay, what are the non-contraceptive benefits? See, I have given a table. Please read it. OCPs and cancers. Hmm? There are other things also. I'll just show you one minute. See, what you have to know is what are the OCPs and cancers? How are they interrelated? That is a very, very important topic. 